Hello everybody. This is the first session in this year. We have Chris from Sweden remotely and he will show us uh, Doku today. So Chris, you could start. Okay. So uh, yeah, the, the topic today and also let me know if, if slides are coming up slowly or whatever. Um, it's kind of hard for me to know when I'm in Sweden and you're down there. Uh, but the topic for today is uh, Docker for developers. And um, I thought I'd start out by just saying that my name is Chris Klug. Uh, I work as a software developer slash architect slash trainer for a company called 1337 in Stockholm. Um, I've also been a Microsoft Most Valuable Professional or MVP for the last seven-ish years or something. Um, and I do a bit of plural site authoring as well. So I, I try to share as much knowledge as I can. And the topic of today is actually deploying software, right? So we're all kind of deploying software at some point, hopefully. Um, I know that some people just build software and don't actually deploy it, but most of us do deploy software. Um, and it, it's kind of a complicated thing, deploying software, right? So especially since we have different environments that we deploy to. So we have this idea where we sit down and we build our software, and we check that software in, or we commit it into Git, or whatever we do, and then we probably have some continuous delivery, continuous integration build that goes off to one server and runs there. And then we might push that to a user acceptance test environment, which is another environment. And then once it's approved there, it gets pushed to a production environment, which in turn is probably yet another environment. And in this case, maybe even a cloud provider. And all of these different environments mean that we have small, tiny differences or even actually large differences between the different environments that we're running in, which makes it kind of hard for us to deploy software because we don't really, we need to make sure that it works in all these different kinds of environments that we're going to push it to at some point. So we've tried solving that over time, many, many times over and over, over the last few years. Um, I've been doing this for about 17 or 18 years now. Um, and I remember the good old, day, old days when we, we just, X copy stuff. We just copy the files across or we'd FTP them to some server somewhere and update everything and it was fine. Um, then we had Microsoft installers, MSI packages. We've had web deploy or we still have web deploy to deploy straight to IIS. We've uh, tried sorting some of the things out with sorting our environments out with stuff like Chef, Chef and Puppet and Ansible. Um, and we've tried automating the whole process using things like Octopus, Visual Studio Team Services, Jenkins, and so on. But in the end, this just solves part of the problem. Yes, Chef and Puppet and Ansible and stuff like that will make sure that our environments have some, sort of the same things installed, but we do still have differences in the environment if we're unlucky. So we have all of these different environments, and they're all small changes, uh, but it would be kind of cool if we could make sure that we could deploy in exactly the same way to all of these environments, right? Um, at least in my world, that would be preferable. Um, not to mention the fact that all of these environments that we're deploying to, we're not just talking about them being different in the way that there are different CPUs or different power or different RAM available or different drives or different IP addresses for our, our uh, servers and all of that. We're also talking about all the stuff on on top of that, like all of the servers, all the server stuff, like the SQL server, or the Redis cache, or uh, the Kibana stuff we need to install, and all the other things that need to be on or in our environment for our application to work. Um, so it's not, as I said, not just hardware it's, and, and operating systems. It's actually the stuff that we install on top of it as well. And I, I assume that most of you guys have gone through the, the hassle of having to set up a new machine. So the question is, are we alone with this problem? Um, not really. Um, there, are other, there are other businesses in the world that actually do kind of what we do. This is going to sound really stupid, I know. But these companies do what we do, right? No, not at all. Well, they kind of do. Because these guys ship stuff around the world. We ship, ship software, they ship physical things, right? But it, there's, there's still a lot of things in common because they ship oddly shaped things all over the world in different countries 
under different circumstances and none of the packages that they send will conform to any specific format and still they manage to do it and we do kind of the same thing we ship software that's oddly shaped it's different for everything that we ship and it goes to different environments and different places in the world and we can't get it to work so the way that they solve it is this right containers and I'm not talking about like physical containers that you use for shipping and the really cool thing about containers, um, I, have a, I have a weird fascination about for containers for some reason, but the cool thing about them is that there are only a certain number of types of containers. So if you look at the, the little um, table at the bottom right here, you can see that there are, what are there? Um, three, six, nine different types of, of, of containers. Different lengths, different heights, different widths. So actually, the width is the same, different lengths, uh, and they have a maximum capacity of weight, but it means that if you look in, up in the corners of a container, you have fixing points. Those fixing points are going to be standardized across the world, which means that if you put something in a container like this, and you know that it's a 40-foot container, the fixing points for that container is going to be in exactly the same position on every single 40-foot container in the world, which means that when you put them into a freight system, you can take that container and you can shove it on a truck, you can put it on a boat, you can lift with it with a lift, or you can even build houses using them. And it doesn't matter if the container is from Sweden or from China, it doesn't matter if the boat is from Sweden or from China, having that standardization means that we can use that same container all over the world. And they know that when I'm saying that I'm gonna send a 40 foot container, they know exactly what's arriving. Sounds pretty smart in my mind, and obviously it kind of works. And that's where Docker comes in. Docker is not the only solution to containerization, but it's one of the more prevalent ones. It's the one that everyone is talking about. And they've basically taken the idea that if we... So... My comment about this slide was that this is where Docker comes in. So the idea behind Docker is that we'll define something called a container, which is a standardized unit for us to deploy our code. And it's basically a, a box or a container, whatever you want to call it, that contains the environment that we want our software to work in. And I'm talking about one piece of our software, so it's one running little thing. So it can contain files, and it can contain setup, and it can contain environment variables and things like that. But it's standardized to the form where I can take one of those containers, and I can put it on, run it on my machine, but I can also take that container, and I can shove it off and have it run in Azure. Or I can run it on a server at my, my company. The, the format is uniform uh, throughout the world, which means that as long as I can package it up as a Docker container or a Docker image, I can have that image or container running in anywhere in the world that I want that supports that format. I'm, I'm going to come back to there being Windows support as well, but let's say you install Linux on it, and then on top of the, the operating system, you have some form of hypervisor, which is a piece of software that emulates hardware. So on top of that, I can then create my virtual machine, and my virtual machine thinks that it's running on a physical machine, but it's really running on software emulated hardware produced by the hypervisor. And then inside of my virtual machine, we install the operating system, and on top of the operating system, we install the, the libraries and the binaries and the applications that we need for our application to run. And finally, we install our app. So that's all fine and dandy. And then that makes no sense whatsoever in the format that I have here, which is one virtual machine on one server. So normally, you'll go ahead and install multiple virtual machines on the same physical hardware, which means that we can make sure that we make the most out of the hardware that we have. So instead of having one piece of hardware running one application and probably only utilizing a small part of the the, uh, the performance we have, we can shove several um, virtual machines onto the same piece of hardware and make sure that we optimally uh, use that, that hardware. 
Containers are a little bit different. So containers still have infrastructure, right? We still need a machine for it to run on. Um, once again, can be anything. Uh, on top of that, we have an operating system. But here is where it starts changing, because instead of an hypervisor, we install something called the Docker engine. And the Docker engine doesn't virtualize hardware. It doesn't create an environment for a new machine to run on. It just creates an engine, or it's just an engine that can run applications for us. And then, on top of the engine, we or we tell the engine that, can you please run this container for me? But the cool thing now is that the container doesn't contain an operating system as such. It contains the binaries and libraries needed for our application, and then our application on top of that. So we don't boot a whole new machine on top of virtualized hardware. Instead, we're running this our application on top of the host operating system, and basically on the host, the, the hardware that we have there, but in a namespaced environment. So if I go ahead and put multiple containers on the same machine, they are still separated and isolated from each other, so app one doesn't conflict with app two. So they have a completely separate network set up. They have completely separate uh, storage and everything. So it's it's kind of like you could think of Docker giving your container access to a bare minimums version of the operating system that you're running or the host that you're running at the moment. So anything you write to the heart to to disk or to storage in your container is written to a sectioned off part that doesn't conflict with anything else. So inside your container, you can't go and overwrite stuff in any other container or on the host. They're completely separate. In the same way that any process running in container A cannot access the host, con host op um, processes, and it can't access the processes in any other containers either. So everything is completely spaced. And just as with the VMs, we can then run as many containers as we want on top of the same piece of hardware. And once again, we can make sure that we make the most out of the hardware that we have by increasing the density of applications on the hardware. Um, once again, I would normally say, does that make sense? But I really hope it does. Um, and it's, it's built around my view of things as a .NET developer. I'm not a, I'm not a Linux person at all. Um, so I kind of see it like this. There are probably technical implica implications here that are a little bit different, but this is the way that it, it works in my head. And if we start looking at the container, so if we just ignore everything up until the Docker engine, we're just going to say that there's going to be a host and it's going to run a Docker engine for us. What we need to do is we need to create containers. Containers is everything we care about. Uh, the actual Docker engine and the host and everything is more of an uh, IT pro DevOps kind of thing that I leave to someone else. So if you look at the actual container, you start out with the host OS. So basically, you, you start out with whatever. So if you're running containers on Windows, for example, you get a bare bones version of the Windows operating system at the bottom, um, or the Windows kernel. And if you're on Linux, you get that Linux kernel at the bottom of your application. And then on top of that kernel, you then install what's called a base image. And most of the time, um, you end up installing some form of operating system stuff on top of that as well. So in this case, I'm saying that I'm going to say I want to start from Ubuntu. And the cool thing is the host, the way that Linux works means that the host doesn't have to be an Ubuntu version of, of Linux. I can actually run any form of Linux kernel that supports Docker, and then I can add Ubuntu or Debian or whatever on top of that. And all of a sudden, I have all of the features from Ubuntu to play with. And then on top of that image, I add a container. Rather, I tell the Docker that, can you please start a container for me? And here is the base image, or here is the image that I want you to build it from. Images, the blue part here, are read-only. So whenever you make a change in your container, you actually never make a change to your image. You have another layer on top. So each one of these layers, the, the base image and the container, gets their own layer of storage. 
So in your base image, the Ubuntu image here, you will see that it basically stores all of the differences between the base kernel storage up until you have a, an environment that, that looks like Ubuntu. And then that difference is stored in the image. And then when you create a container on top of that, you create another layer of, of storage that you can write to. But when you write and save something inside of your container, it gets written to the containers layer, not to the base image. So that means that we can put several containers using the same base image because container A and container B will actually never change anything in the base image Ubuntu in this case. But we can also go and say, okay, so I have container A running on my machine using Ubuntu, but I'm going to create another image on top of that base image Ubuntu and say, can you add .NET Core? That gives me another image, which I could call .NET Core or whatever. And then I could create another image on top of that in which I basically create and add all of the, the things that I need for my application to run. And finally, I can tell it, tell the Docker system that, can you please start a container based on the image called add prereq? And that means that it spins up the Ubuntu layer, and then on top of the Ubuntu layer, it adds the layer where I added the .NET Core dependencies. And then on top of the .NET Core dependencies, it adds the layer where I added my prerequisites for my application. And then it starts off the container and gives me another storage layer where I can, can write and stuff right to, to storage and my application is running. But the cool thing is we can also go and say, okay, so I've got two containers running Ubuntu, but this thing I'm starting up over here is actually gonna run Debian. And then I have another image on top of Debian, the Debian image that says add Emacs. And then I can go and tell Docker, can you please create a new container based on the add Emacs image? Um, and it creates a new container for me that contains Debian with Emacs, and then it gives me the layer where I can write. So that's kind of cool, and it means that we have all of these abilities to, to build up our environments. So in this case, it's once again very Linux-focused, and I'll show you more ASP.NET Core-based stuff, which is going to run on Linux, but it's going to make more sense when I show you code. But inside an image, um, it's kind of interesting as well. So if we look at images, you most of the time start from a parent image. You have some form of image that somebody has built that you build upon. So it can be Ubuntu, it can be Debian, it can be, there's one called Alpine that I like to use. It's, it's a tiny image, it's only five megs, but it gives me the Linux stuff plus some helper tools that's in there. Um, so what I've got here is, is how an image is built up. So I'm, I'm always going to start from some form of parent image. Um, normally, that's a, a some form of, of Linux operating system. So it's, it's Ubuntu or Debian or, or something like that, um, or Alpine. Alpine is, is a tiny little Linux distro, which is only five megs. Um, and, but, but you can also start from scratch. So if you're a Linux developer and know exactly how to start without anything at all, you can just start from scratch, it's this parent image scratch, which basically says, I don't want anything, I'll make sure that everything works on my own, which is a bit more complicated. But we have this parent image, just assume that we have a parent image of some kind, uh, maybe Ubuntu. And then I go and say, I want to have a new image. So I'm going to have my image here. And inside my image, I have a reference saying that this image references this parent image. Kind of. And then I tell my image, or I, I create my image by basically saying, copy f these files into, the my, into my image from um, my hard drive or whatever. Just copy files A, B, and C into my image. And then I want to set the environment variable X, Y, Z to, to a value as well. And then I want to copy some more files. And uh, then I want to tell my image that whenever you create a container from my image, um, set it all up and run x.exe for me. And finally, when I don't, then tell Docker to start a container based on my image, it's going to load up all of the, the these 
layers of data from the parent image. So it starts out with the with the kernel, the Linux kernel, and then it takes all of the layers of data um, that's in the the parent image, and then it starts adding all of the layers on top of that. That's from my image, which is the files A, B, and C, and then the variable environment variable that needs to be set, and then it adds the files X, Y, and Z, and then it starts the entry point for me, and my container is up and running. So if I go into my container and I look at the file system in my container, I'm going to find the files A, B, C, X, Y, Z, and I'm going to see that there's an environment variable called X, Y, Z. So it's kind of all packaged up, but each one of these images would get really big if they contained everything. So what Docker does is that every single layer of storage or every single data layer that you have so in the case, for example, copy files A, B, C, that gets its own layer, and each layer gets an, a, um, a hash of the contents. And that's kind of cool because it means that if you build two images that share a certain amount of data, they can, they can share that information and there's only one instance saved of it. So if I create another image here that points towards the same parent image, copies the same A, B, and C file, and sets the same X, Y, Z variable, uh, environment variable, it can share all of those layers, and then it only differs on that last layer that says copy files F, E, G. So each data layer that you have points to the previous one. So it's not really your image pointing to a parent image, it's basically your data layer pointing to the previous data layer, which points to the previous data layer, so it knows when you tell it what image you want to run, it can figure out all of the data layers that needs to be added on top of the host to get to the state that you want your container to be in. And then it, once again, if those data layers happens to correspond to, to something that you've already got or be, be equal to what you've got, it only stores one set of that data layer. So it's going, only going to store one set of each of the data layers in the parent image and one set of the copy files A, B, and C and one lay, set of the layer set environment variable, but then it's going to change and be different between the top two on the left-hand side and the top one on the second side. So if, copy fi if, if files A, B, and C were really huge files, you would still only have one instance of those on your, your machine, which means that your images get a little bit smaller. So images are kind of cool. Um, and then once you have your image, um, you, or ra sorry, rather, if you want to get an image that someone has created for you, so if you don't want to just use your own images, like you want to go and get the Ubuntu image, or you want to go and get the Alpine image, or whatever, you, you use your, your client called the Docker client, and you say Docker pull, and you give it the name of the image that you want to pull down on your machine. And it pulls down all of those layers and sets them up on your machine so that you can use them and use that image to create containers. So what we have is Docker pull, in this case, zero call slash my image. So it's assuming that I want to download an image called zero call my image. This actually means docker pull hub.docker.com slash zero call slash my image. So unless you specifically tell it another host name, when you do a docker pull, it's going to go and look at hub.docker.com. So docker hub is a massive repo of images. There are public images and private images. Um, I, have, I have one public image up there, which is a demo image. Uh, but you'll find public images for a bunch of really big projects, like Redis, for example, or MySQL and stuff like that. Um, but then you can pay, and you can have your own private area up there that requires you to log in to download images. So once you've built your image on your machine, you can go and do docker, docker push, and you can push your image from your local machine to a public repository or a public uh, registry um, where all of your images can be located so that people can download them and they can get deployed to your servers or other people can use them and things like that. So what we get here is, if we look at the URL that we're having, we've got hub.docker.com slash zero call slash my image which is once again 
actually a bit of a fake because what you've got is actually hob.docker.com slash zero call slash my image colon latest. So the last time, whenever you rebuild your image, if you make some changes to it and you build another image, you make some changes to it and you build an image, say that you're building your application, you make some changes to your application, you create a new image from that application, every time you rebuild that image, it's going to get the tag latest at the end, and then the previous one that used to be latest is going to get untagged. So it's going to disappear. It's, it's going to be on your machine, but it's not going to have a proper name. So what we have here is we've got the register name, which is hub.docker.com. Um, and if you don't want to use hub.docker.com, you can go and get, you can set up your own registry, or you can go and get a registry at Amazon Web Services, or you can get a registry uh, at Azure, uh, or whatever. There's a bunch of services out there that will host your images for you in on a public machine. Then you give it the so-called repository name, which is basically the name of your image. So the repository name, when it comes to a, a, a public repo or a public registry, is going to be username or organization name or whatever, slash, and then the name of the image that you've got going on. And finally, you'll have a tag at the end. So all of your images can have what's called tags. And you can have as many as you want. By default, the last time you build or create an image, that image gets, or that that version gets the tag latest, because it's the latest one that you did. But you can go ahead, if you've got a, a 1.0 release of your software, you can build an image, you can add the tag 1.0, in that case the address would be hub.docker.com slash zero call slash my image colon 1.0. So that way we can keep track of our images and give them versions and we can give them, say that it's a dev release of 1.0 or whatever. So tags is kind of the way that we keep track of our, our images. And to be perfectly honest, the repository name, like the zero call slash my image in this case, is actually a tag as well. So if you don't tag your image, you're going to get a unique identifier for your image instead, which is going to be a, a massive long string that you don't want to remember. So we generally always add that first tag saying zero call slash my image so that I as a human being can figure out that that repository is going to contain my image. So how do we get started? Well, it's actually ridiculously simple. Um, it took me a while to get started with Docker on my machine because I thought it's going to be it's going to be a crapshoot to get started with. It's always complicated. It's it's going to run virtual machines and it's going to have it's Linux and I don't know how to do it and all of that. And then finally I sat down and did it and it's about as complicated as this. You go to Docker.com/Docker-Windows or you just Google for Docker for Windows. Docker for Windows is the last incarnation. There's also a Docker for Mac, so if you're on a Mac, you can install the same thing. Um, there used to be something called Docker Toolbox, I think it was called, which is a previous version. Um, I prefer Docker for Windows, but that requires Windows 10, and it runs on Hyper-V, so you have to have Hyper-V on your ma machine. Um, you can also go with Docker... Toolbox, Docker Toolbox, which then allows you to run some other virtualization stuff and all of that, but this is the by far the easiest way to get started. Just download this, run the installer, and once the installer is, is built, you get this on your machine. So on the left-hand side here, you see there's a Docker is now up and running thing in a little window with a whale on it. That's basically a little client that sits in your sysray when the application is running, that just makes sure it, it monitors a Linux virtual machine that's running under Hyper-V, which you can see here in the Hyper-V manager, it's called Mobi Linux VM. And you use that tool, that little sysTray thing, uh, and that window here to start and stop and manage it and, and manage memory and all of it. You don't do it through Hyper-V, you do it through this tool instead. Hyper-V just shows you that it's there. And then besides that virtual machine, you get a, the client on your machine, the Docker client. So you get Docker available in PowerShell or your command line. And that Docker client is already set up to communicate with the Mobi Linux VM. So you're not going to be running Docker on your local machine. 
you're going to be running Docker inside of a vir Linux virtual machine on your computer. So when you run, in this case, I'm running Docker version, it's actually sending commands to my mobile Linux VM, my, my Docker virtual machine, asking it for information. It's kind of seamless, uh, but it, it, you kind of have to remember that in some cases, you're sitting there and you're running all of your Docker commands, but you're still running them on a separate machine. So it is, it is a VM on your machine that's running actual Docker. So let's see what, what it's like running a container. So I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to pull up PowerShell like that. Are you still with me? Yeah. I'm just I'm, I'm going to ask now, so it's not you're going to come back in 45 minutes and go, we haven't heard anything. Um, but I hope you're with me. Um, I've got PowerShell here. Can you see that, or do you need a bigger font? What? Bigger. Bigger font. I'll give you a bit of a bigger font. Uh, is is that enough? Yes. Okay. So what we do now is we we have the Docker client, and I tell run Docker that I want to run something. I want to take an image and I will run a container based on that. And I'm going to run in interactive mode. I, dash IT doesn't actually stand for interactive, but it's an easy way to remember it. Um, interactive means that it's actually going to connect any cons outputs, any standard out is going to be redirected to my client here, and it will also connect a, a sev.tty connection to it. So it's basically going to make it possible for me to sit here in my console and communicate inside of my, my container and run stuff inside of my container. And then I'm going to tell it that I want to run an Ubuntu, Ubuntu um, image. If I run that, you see that didn't take very long. It, it takes a couple of seconds for it to start. So I am now, I, those two, in those, what, two seconds, it spun up a container for me with Ubuntu on it. And if we look in here, we look at there, we can see there's a file system for me. That file system is completely inside of my container. I can't destroy anything. Even if I were to start deleting files in here, I will not destroy my host at all. So this thing will keep being open. I can have a look at different things in here. I can run, oh, so um, I can't do this. Uh, uh, I can find out that the host name is just an order generated A1, A, blah, 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 blah. If config, which is the same thing as IP config in Windows, isn't available in Ubuntu apparently, so I can run that. But I can sit in here and I can run my commands and I have a Linux machine that I'm, I'm working on at the moment, which is kind of cool. As soon as I exit out of my, my shell here, I end back up at my, uh, my PowerShell shell instead. And if we look at Docker PS-A, which means Docker, can you show me all of the containers running on my machine? You'll see here. Actually, I'm going to stretch it out and see if we can get it better in here. Uh, not really. Uh, we can see here that there's an Ubuntu image. Throughout my presentation, there's going to be one down here, which is a Microsoft SQL Server on Linux thing. Just ignore that. But what you've got here is you've got my container called A1A94571B8B1. It's based on Ubuntu. When it starts, it runs the bash. It was created about a minute ago, and it exited 16 seconds ago when I run, ran the, the Docker PS. And all of the containers get an ID, and it, if you don't specifically give it a name, it gets a name based on a, uh, a verb, uh, or sorry, an adjective, and a noun, so, um, or a name. So it becomes silly jolly or hardcore arabiata or whatever. Uh, it just makes it easier for you to look at the, them and not just look at the, the IDs. So I can then say docker rm, which is docker, can you please remove, and I want to remove this container here, so I can either use silly joliot, or I can say, can you please remove the container with this ID here? Luckily, we only need to use enough ID um, characters for it to be unique. So there's no other container that starts with A1A, so I just have to type docker rma1a, and if we do docker ps, 
dash a, you'll see that my container is now gone. Uh, we can also go and say docker run dash it interactive dash dash rm, which is another favorite uh, thing for me. It basically says whenever this container, whenever I exit it and it stops, a container only keeps running as long as there's an, a, a file, an executable in there locking the main thread. So as soon as that main application that's running inside of my container dies, can you please remove the container? Don't stop it, don't leave it there in a stop state, remove it for me. And then we'll try and do Alpine. And we'll do like that. And we'll see, it takes a couple of seconds. I'm inside of my Alpine container. If I do LS, you'll see that I've got a file system in here as well, inside of my Alpine distribution. And if we exit out of that, we look at my Docker disk, you can see that it's gone. So it, it basically, I can run my little container, I can run whatever Linux commands or whatever I want to do inside of it, and once I close down my, my um, bash in here, it kills the container and removes everything, so there's nothing left on my machine. We can also go ahead and run like this, and we can add at the end here, ls. So most of these um, base images are based around the idea that you can define what command you want to run inside of the container. So in this case, I'm telling it to start up a container. Um, I'm actually going to, sorry, I'm going to remove the IT here. I'm going to have that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, Docker, can you please run a container for me using the Alpine image? Inside of it, once it's, when you start it up, can you please run the command ls for me? And then once ls completes, the, the thread isn't locked anymore, so my container is going to stop. And once the container is stopped, I pass in the dash dash rm, which basically says, can you remove the container for me again? If I run this now, you'll see here that I've got the list of all of the, the directories inside of my, my um, container. But if we look at the list of containers, there's no container anymore. So if you just want to quickly run um, some form of um, execution, you just want to run some batch script of some kind or whatever, uh, and you don't want to do it on your local machine, you want to be able to run it over and over and over again, you create, create an image and just run that like this, and it runs the batch for you and kills off the container as soon as you're done. So that's about as hard as it gets. Um, that is running a container. It's nothing more complicated than that. But running containers like that is kind of useless, right? Unless you think it's really cool to sit on a Linux machine and, and uh, write awkward commands. What we really want to do is we want to start and run, build our own images with our own software on it. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to pull up this thing. I'm going to make it bigger and I'm going to clean the screen. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say docker run. I want to do it interactively. And I'm going to give it a name this time. So I'm going to add uh, a dash dash name, and I'm call it interactive interactive build. Um, and I'm going to map a port on it. So I'm going to map port 8080. Sorry, map a port 8080 to port 80. That command basically tells Docker that can you map? The thing is. Each container has its own unique network, so it's not connected to anything. So unless I specifically tell it to map ports, my container lives in complete isolation from everything else. Adding a dash p 8080 port 80 tells Docker that can you please map port 8080 on the host to port 80 inside of my container. So it uses NAT inside of it. With Docker for Windows, this is a little bit weird because it actually maps port 8080 on my local Windows machine to port 80 inside of my container inside of my Linux virtual machine. I am not a network guy, so please do not ask me to explain how that works, but it, it works. I need to tell it what, what image I want to base it on. So I'm going to base it on a Microsoft image, image. so it's Microsoft slash ASP.NET core-build. Um, we're going to start that. So the ASP.NET Core build image is a, um, a Microsoft-based Linux image that has all of the ASP.NET Core prerequisites for .NET Core 2.0, and the dash build version of it has um, all the tools that we need to build it. So it includes the SDK and Node. Uh, I think it contains Node. Uh, it does. Um, how do you get out of Node? Like, like that, maybe, yes. 
Um, and, and a few other little build things in there. So it's, uh, it's helpful for us to build ASP.NET Core applications, but it's not the image you should use as your production image for your application because it has too much stuff on it. So it's a little bit heavy. So what I'm going to do is here, in here is I'm going to have a look at what it, what's in here, and I'm going to go and say mkdir app, and I'm going to create an app in here. And then I'm going to see the app. So inside of my app, app uh, directory, I'm going to go and say .NET new MVC. So that's going to go and create a new .NET MVC application inside of the app folder. Uh, so that runs the, sets up the project and everything. And if we ls in here, you'll see that it has all the stuff that we need in here. It runs uh, dot, the .NET restore, so it gets all the NuGet packages for me. So here's a perfect application or a fully working application. So, and if I go and say .NET run, and wait a little while, because .NET Core builds slightly slowly, slower than you'd expect, um, or you'd want. So it goes up here. You can see that it, it's listening on port 80, and I mapped port 8080 on my local machine to port 80 in the container. So if I go to localhost 8080, you will now see an ASP.NET Core application running. And that is, if we go back to PowerShell, you will see that it, well, you won't actually see it for some reason. It's, oh, so it's running in, in release mode uh, or production mode, which means that we don't get all of the output here that we normally get from an ASP.NET in the core application. But it is running, so if I, if I go out here, I stop that, and I exit out of my application. We can undo docker pps a. We can see that there is an application here called 8b8. Um, which runs bash, and it exited six seconds ago. So it's down now, and if I go back out here, and I refresh this page, you will now see that it's dead, so I was really running inside of that container. What I want to do now is I'm going to go ahead and say docker commit, which is telling docker that I want to take the state that this container is in and commit that to an image. I want to make a couple of changes, though. I want to make sure that the work directory the work dir of my application is app, so whenever it starts up, I want to be inside of the app directory for execution. And I want to make a change that says entry point dot net run. So that tells the system that when this image is used, go to the app directory and run dot net run for me whenever it started. And then we say, um, we tell it that we want to have interactive build, which is the name of my container. You can see here, it's called interactive, name is interactive container, or interactive build. And finally, I need to give it a name, so I'm going to say that it's going to be called zero call slash interactive. On that, it's done. If I look at my images on my machine, you'll now see that, except for all of the other images that are already on my machine, there is a new image called Zero Call Interactive. It was the latest one, and it was built four seconds ago. And it's 1.86 gigabytes. So using that, I can then go and say docker ps-a, so we can see it's still up there, but it's dead. So I'm going to say docker rm interactive underscore build docker ps-a, you'll see that my docker is, my container is gone, so it's not up and running now. Now we can go, now that I have my image, I can go and say docker run interactively. I'm going to do rm to have it removed when I'm done. I'm going to, once again, I have to map my ports, so I'm mapping port 8080 to port 80 on the, on the container, and I want to use the image called zero call slash interactive like that. Run that and and there it is. It's up and running. It has hosting environment production. It's located at app. It's listening to port 80 and if I go back out here and I refresh my page you will see that it's serving up my application again. So that's kind of cool, right? 
Um, if I go out of this thing now, if I if I exit out of my uh, Docker, we can do Docker on my container ps dash a. Um, you can see that it's it's, it's dead. Um, it's gone. What I can do is I can do I can do run, but instead of dash it, I'm going to run it with d. So d, dash d means disconnected. It means that run it in the background. Don't connect me to it. Just have it running in the background. All I get when I run that command is the the unique identifier for my container. And if we look at the list of containers, there is now a container called um, <clears throat> Dazzling Current, which runs Zero Call Interactive. It, it's it's been up for six seconds. It's been up for 17 seconds. And if I refresh this page out here. If I refresh this page out here, it is up and running now in a new container. Cool thing though is that when I do docker stop dazzling current, it takes a little while for it to kill it because uh, .NET Core has to die. Shouldn't take this long though. There it is. Docker ps-a, you'll see that it's now removed my container, everything is gone, there is nothing left that says that I've ever run that application on my machine. Last thing I want to do is, as you can see, we, it, we can end up with a lot of images on your machine, which is not really what you want in a lot of cases, especially when they're big. So I'm going to do docker rmi, which means docker remove image, zero call slash interactive, and if we look at the images again, my image is now gone and there's no recollection on my machine or nothing left on my machine that it has ever existed. Um, okay, so we've seen it, how we can build one interactively. I do not recommend doing this. It's, it's a pain in the butt to do. It's kind of cool when you want to get something started, want to try something out to see if it works and everything, because you can be inside the container and do all, do all of the debugging and everything. But in the end, we want to have this repeatable, right? Repeatable. So we want to be able to write a way of having these configured um, instead of manually creating them. We could create them using a bunch of scripts and stuff, but what we want to do is we actually want to do it from something called a Docker file. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go to, actually, let's, let's do it like this. <coughs> I have this code here. I have some demos. So I'm going to go here and temp and uh, demos. And I have my demo app. So I'm going to open this up in, actually, I'm going to open this up in, let's open it here. So, So I'm going to open this application up here, um, and it's, it's a fairly simple application. Um, if we look at the, the code, it, it's basically just an ASP.NET application that uses ASP.NET MVC. Can you see that? Yes. 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 Okay. Um, so it, it just uses MVC. It has a, a, a single controller with a single view, and it just returns a view at the slash uh, path. Uh, and if we look at the index, all it does in here, it writes out the machine name, the current directory, the OS version, and the environment name. Basically, just information about where it's running, which is all I needed for this demo. So what I want to do in here is I want to go and create a new file. So I'm going to create something called a Docker file. It's just called Docker file, doesn't have a file extension, causes havoc, wreaks havoc in, in um, explorer.exe, because Explorer wants you to have a file extension, but we'll just do, do one without one. And inside here, I tell it, what image do I want to use as a base image? So I'm going to use Microsoft slash ASP.NET Core dash build, um, like that. And I want to go ahead, and what I want to do inside of this image, I want to start off, but I want to copy everything in this folder, same folder as the, the Docker file, so dot. And I want to copy that to slash app inside of my image. Then I want to set the work directory, work dir, to slash app, saying that this is where I want to be when I execute things inside of my directory, <laughs> inside of my container. And then I want to run .NET 
restore. So run here, basically, it actually starts up a container for me. It runs .NET restore, and whatever is in that container after that run is what's going to be stored as that layer in my image. So this, this is going to be a part of building the image, not a part of running the container, if that makes sense. And finally, I want to tell it what command I want to use. So when this application starts, I want to run .NET run. You can write this either as an array like this, or you can just write a string, which is .NET run. Both work. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to use this so you can see that as well. So this is all I need. This basically creates the same thing that I did um, previously, except that I didn't do .NET new. I, I copied my application across. And then I want to have one more file. I want to have a .docker ignore file. And I'm just going to say that please do not bring in any fold, anything from the folder bin or anything from obj. This doesn't mean that it's not being added to the image. So instead, this is a bit hard to explain, but when you run an image, when I, when I run this Docker file here, when I tell Docker to, to build based on that Docker file, it's actually going to take everything inside of this folder as what's called a context and use that when it runs the build or when it builds the, the image. The Docker ignore is used for that. So I don't want to upload the bin and obj folder to my VM to have that build my image for me. So I'm just adding that. So when I run or when I build my image, it uploads all the files in this directory except the bin and object folder, if that makes sense. So once I've got that, that little file in there, I can go back here to PowerShell. I can uh, increase the font a little bit. That was a bit much, that one. And in here, all I need to do, so we'll just do dir to make sure that I'm in the right place. I am. So I have my Docker file here. I'll do docker build. What do I want to build? I want to build dot. Dot means current directory, and what I need to do is I need to point to a directory that contains a Docker file. So it's this this directory here, and I want to add a tag to it. So I want to name my image something. So I'm going to name it demo app. Run that. You'll see here that it it step one is creating getting my base image. Step two, copy across all of my files. Step three, set up the work directory. Step four, run .NET restore for me. And you can see the output here. It, it did the .NET restore uh, in an intermediate container. So it basically took whatever was in, in here and added that. And then step five is I'm just changing the, the thing to execute when it starts and store that in a layer in, in itself. If I do Docker images now, you'll see that there is a new, direct, new repository here called demo app. That's my latest version of that image. And then I can run that using docker run. Let's do these. We'll do it um, detached. Map port 8080 to port 80 inside of my container. Make sure it's removed when I'm done with it. So just give it a name, demo app. And the image that I want to use is demo app like this. Run that. Docker PS-8 to see all of my, or I can, actually I can do Docker PS to just get the running ones. We can see that that's up and running. And opening this thing up here, refreshing my localhost port 8080. It starts up doc, .NET Core, and here is my application. So you can see that it's running on a machine called BF75D3978B19. Current directory is slash app. I'm running on Unix. And I'm running in production mode. And when I'm done with that, I can just go in here and I can say docker stop, what was the container ID? BF7, BF7. Docker PS-A. We can see here that it's gone because I added the dash dash RM, which removes the container whenever it stopped. So using this, I can go ahead and I can just create all of these little Docker files. I can tell it to copy things and set up things, and I can run things. So this basically runs inside of a uh, of an instance of, or of the image before. So anything I can go in here and install things and all of it, and it's going to be in the image when when the image is done. Um. So that's kind of cool. 
But there are a couple of weird things with this. Um, for example, storage is a bit um, interesting because storage is local to the container. So whenever the container dies, uh, storage dies. So if you save anything inside of a container and you stop that container, that's fine. If you start it up back up again, it's there. But if you put, store anything inside of a container and you delete that container, then the contents of that container is gone and anything that you stored inside of it is gone as well. Uh, generally, a quite good idea is to keep your containers stateless. But if you do need to add state, you need to find a way to do that. So we have the ability to store data inside of our container. We can store it in something called a bind mount. We can store it in something called a volume. And we can store it in something called a temp tempfs mount. So container storage is, as I said, it's just stored inside of the container. And when the container dies and you remove it, content is removed as well. Bind mounts are kind of cool because they bind the directory or a file from your local computer, or the host rather, sorry, the, the host that hosts the containers, to a path inside of the container. So I can take a path on my local machine and map that to a path inside of the container, and when the container can then read files off my machine, and it can write stuff to my machine as well, or to the host. Volumes, on the other hand, are basically a storage area that Docker maintains. So you tell Docker that you want to have a volume with a name called my data or whatever. It will set up that storage somewhere on the on the host, and then you can map that information into the, to the uh, containers. The cool thing is that volumes are detached from containers. So even if you kill and remove your container, the volume is still there, but it's in a location that's not your machine, it's, it's maintained by Docker instead. And finally, tempfs mounts is basically just temporary storage. It's, it looks like um, storage on disk, so basically you store to a path, but it's actually just stored in memory, um, and you generally use it for sensitive data. So you don't want to store passwords and, and things like that uh, on physical drives, so by doing this, it's only stored in memory, and whenever the, the uh, container dies, um, the, the memory is wiped, so there's nothing left. Let's have a look at setting up a bind mount to share data between uh, the host and the, uh, and the client, or sorry, the, the container. I'm going to go out of here, and I have another little application here called Image Viewer Web. I'm going to open that in code. So what I've built here is it's just a, a little... Um, um, little ASP.NET Core application. And the only thing it does is if we look at the uh, controller, the home controller, it pretty much just goes and looks at the images folder inside of the www root folder. So basically inside www root, there's an images folder with two images. It looks inside of that um, images folder gets all the files that are either JPEGs, PNGs, or GIFs, and renders them to the view. So I can, I can browse my images. And I can also upload images by posting them to this, this endpoint here. And they are also saved in the images folder using a new grid as the name. It's a very simple image viewer like this. Um, and I've written a Docker file for it, which is pretty much exactly the same that you saw before. Microsoft ASP.NET Core build, it copies the app to the app directory, sets the app as the work directory, restores it, and runs it for me. So if I go ahead and I pull, let's try and do it from in here. So if I take this thing here and I say, docker build current directory, tag it with image viewer web, for example. Actually, let's just do image viewer. So it, it sets up the image for me. It sets up the image for me. There it is. And if we do Docker images, you'll now see that there's an image viewer in here. Actually, I'm just going to delete that while I remember it. Docker RMI demo app. So I have the Docker image viewer in here. The, sorry, the image viewer. 
So I can go ahead and say docker run. I want to map port 8080 on my local machine or the host to port 80. I want to do it in detached mode and I want to make sure that it's removed and I'm going to give it a name image viewer and I'm going to use the image called image viewer viewer like that. So if I run that, it sets up the application for me, and if we look at the, the Docker containers here, you'll see that there's a new container set up four seconds ago uh, with a port mapped. Uh, and if we open this up, we go to localhost port 8080. I don't remember what images I put up there. Okay, they were not fantastic. Um, so here are a couple of images, um, and if I choose a new file and upload something new, so let's upload a picture of myself, submit that, you'll see that it's uploaded. Fine, right? If I go back to this again and I say dot no docker stop image viewer docker ps dash a you'll see that my container is gone. If I refresh out here you'll see that it's dead. It doesn't work anymore. If I start a new container with the same settings and everything, I just restart the same container. And then I go back out here and I refresh this. It takes a little while for it to start up because it needs to start Docker inside of it or .NET inside of it for me. Why is that not working now? There it is. It's gone. So the file that I uploaded is gone for the very simple reason that it was uploaded to container, I killed and deleted the container, and once I do that, storage inside of the container dies as well. So if we do docker stop, Im actually I had that, let's do that. Docker PS. Okay. You can see that it's now gone again, and this thing here doesn't respond if I try to request anything from it. It's dead. So what, what I can do now is I can actually I can run pretty much the same thing here, but I'm going to go ahead and add something else here. I'm going to go ahead and say, actually, uh, I'm going to go ahead and say dash v. Say, can you please map a volume for me to it? And I want to map this. This is going to be a little bit weird, but it's going to say uh, Profile. So basically, get the user profile path from the environment variables slash pictures like that. So that's on my local machine, and I want to map that to slash app, which is where my application is located, slash www root slash images. Run that. So the cool thing now is that when I map this. I already had a slash app slash www root slash images in my image, but this is getting mapped in on top of my image in my writable part of it in my container, which means that it's going to take whatever is at that path at the user profile slash pictures and locate, put that in that, that path instead. So I'm actually replacing the existing one. And if I refresh this now, you'll see that it finds two other pictures from my local machine. If we look at in my pictures here, you'll see that the pictures are actually coming out of my local machine. And if I go choose file and I upload a beautiful picture of myself, it ends up on my local machine. So I can map in these folders from the host um, uh, into my containers. It is kind of weird now that I am mapping in... Um, my host machine's folder into a container that's running on a Linux virtual machine on my machine, but just ignore that. Just assume that it, it's basically you're mapping something from your host. Docker for Windows is a special scenario that, that makes it weird, but normally you would map a directory or a file from your local host that runs the Docker stuff into your container, if that makes sense. So volumes are great if you want to have persistent storage. So you can set up a bind mount like this for development purposes, uh, or you can set up volumes uh, for persistent storage in um, in a production environment. And you can also, for volumes, you can also use plugins. So you can go and say, I want to use this volume here, but I don't want to bind it to 
I don't want Docker to do it for me. I actually want to use a plugin for it, and then I can say, can you please map this blob storage uh, f um, drive for me in Azure or this uh, Amazon Web Services uh, storage for me so we can externalize the storage into third-party systems using plugins as well. And then we've got a, a, a quick jump into networking. Um, I apparently don't know how to spell. I just need to fix that. We apparently got... I Actually, I can't spell it all. That says networking like that, right? Um, you guys are the first people in the world that get to see this presentation. So that's why there are weird stuff in it. So networking is interesting. We've got the LAN or the internet or whatever. Let's say it's, it's the LAN that you're connected to. And you've got your host, your local machine. Um, and it gets an IP address. Uh, that should probably be 192, 168, 1, 1, 2, 3. It could be anything. Your host gets an IP address. That's the big thing. And in my case, the host then, I, I have my Hyper-V virtual switch, which is on my machine that shares that internet connection. Uh, which gets um, a completely different IP address. Um, and then those, that switch is where the containers are connected. So the containers get 172.17.02.3.4, whatever, a, a climbing number. But it's kind of hard. You don't want to rely on IP addresses because you could just as well have gotten those IP addresses. So whenever you spin up a container, it just grabs a new IP address from a specific span. So you can't go and say that container one is going to be available on this, this IP address and container two on that one. You do want to go and make it a little bit more complicated and give your containers aliases so you can actually find them. So a cool demo for that is setting up a reverse proxy. There's been a bit of talk in A3.NET Core that you don't want to go ahead and use um, the, the web server in A3.NET Core publicly on the web. You can now, but it, you, in a lot of cases, you do want to put something in front of it, like Nginx, for example. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to take my application here. My application, once again, is the same application that you just saw that, that just returns, not the previous example, but the one before, that, that returns information about the host. It's exactly the same. I just copied it across. And then I've got an nginx thing here. So the Docker file in here for my nginx um, image basically says, go ahead and get the nginx Alpine edition. And then I want you to copy the nginx configuration from the local file here into slash etc slash nginx slash nginx conf. And this thing in here just has um, forwarding stuff. It has forwarding saying that listen to port 80 and proxy that on to HTTP colon slash web. And slash web in this case is this thing here. So it says it's the, the server is called web and it's on port 80. So it, it becomes a, re, a reverse proxy for me. And then I want to go ahead and pull up one of these so we can, can do some Docker stuff. So what I want to do is I want to create a network. So I'm going to go Docker network. There is a, there's a default network that all containers get connected to, and inside of that network they can communicate to each other using um, uh, IP addresses and, and so on. But I want to create a specific network for this demo. So I'm going to go and say docker network create my network. Boom, a new network set up. So if we do docker network ls, you can see here that there are a few different networks in here, but there is one. My network is a bridge network that uses the internet connection on my machine. So I have my network. So let's do kill that. And then we'll go ahead and say, uh, ooh, sorry, there's one more thing inside of my app. I forgot that. Um, in my app, I actually set up the use of um, Redis. So I'm setting up a, a distributed cache using a Redis instance. And I configure that using this thing here. Um, and the information about the name of my Redis server comes out of an environment variable as well. So I need to have three things in here. I need a Redis cache. I need an Nginx uh, reverse proxy. And I need my AS.NET Core application up and running. So I'm going to start. go ahead and start with my, uh, with my Redis one. So I'm going to go ahead and say, 
docker run dash d for the nope docker run dash d for detached mode running background dash dash rm just to clean it up when I'm done then dash dash network and tell it that I want it to join the network called my network and I want to tell it that the network alias for this machine is Redis. So doing that, it means that every machine on the My Network network can find this container using um, the alias Redis. And I'll name it uh, My Redis, and it's going to base, be based on an image called Redis. And there you have it. I have a Redis cache running on my machine now. So if you ever want to play around with Redis, it takes about that long to spin up a Redis cache for you. The next step is I want to build my app and create a, an image based on that. So I'm going to do docker build, and it's in the app folder. And I want to tag it with my app. So it builds my application for me. So if we do docker images, there should now be a my app one here. And then I'm going to go and say docker run once again. Actually, let's let's reuse that thing there. I'm going to run detached rem remove when done attached to my network. Call the uh, the net container web on the network alias. So whenever um, nginx needs to access it, it can go to http colon slash slash web. And I'm going to name it my uh, my app, and it's going to be based on the image my app. But there's one more thing I want to do in here. So I told you that it it figures out the name of the Redis cache container on the network using an environment variable. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to add an environment variable here as well called Redis, and I'm going to set the value to Redis as well. For on that, that means that when this container spins up, um, it's automatically going to have an environment variable called Redis with the value Redis, and when it reads that, it figures out where the Redis cache server is. But an important thing here is that I'm actually not at any point mapping any ports, so I can't access this machine. It's, it's completely off the grid. I can't access it. It's living inside of its own network. Finally, I can do docker build again, but I, I'm going, this time I'm going to build the nginx server. So I'm going to build nginx, and I'm going to call it my nginx. That's a very fast one to build because it's tiny. And then I'm going to go and run. I'm not going to run, I'm not going to add the environment variable, but I'm going to put it on the same network. I'm going to give it a name, so I'm going to call it Actually, it doesn't need a name because it doesn't need to be accessed in any way. So let's just remove the name completely. I'm going to give it a name, which is my nginx. And it's going to be based on the image my nginx as well, nginx like that. But I need to map some ports. So this one is a reverse proxy, so it needs to re respond to ports. So I'm going to do port 8080 on my local machine to port 80 on the nginx machine. Run that. Docker ps a. We can have a look here. Actually, just Docker ps. We can see here there's running three machines and my nginx that has mapped port 8080 to port 80, the my app and the the Redis cache. And if I go out here, I can go localhost port 8080, and there it is. And if I refresh this, you'll see that the request date here is stored inside of the Redis cache as the, um, the first time I requested it, and it finds the Redis cache at Redis. So I can build this, um, this stack of machines quite easily. So all I need to do now, I'm just going to go and say docker ps, uh, so I'm going to say docker stop my nginx, docker stop my app, and docker stop redis. It wasn't called redis, it's called my redis. And if we look now at docker ps, 
you'll see nothing there, uh, and there's no recollection or no, nothing left on my machine except for a few images here that I can remove. Docker RMI my app. Actually, let's not leave the. Actually, let's kill those. Docker RMI my app uh, and my nginx. I don't want to have those there. Docker images. What did I call that one? I didn't. Okay, it's not there. Um, so that's kind of cool. Um, nothing left. I tried to set up. So I managed to set up three machines with semi-complicated software in a demo like this, and it takes five minutes to do. But it's kind of annoying having to do it all manually. So there's a way to do it um, using uh, a configuration file instead. So you, you build this Docker Compose YAML file, and you tell it basically what different containers do I need to run, how are they built, what ports do I need to map, what networks do I need to attach to, and what environment variables do I need, and all of that. And then I can just go and say Docker Compose up and give it my YAML file, and it does it all for me. So if we look at that, it looks like this. So I'm going to Docker Compose, open this in code. So in here, I've got exactly the same thing. Uh, these are, this time, I, I'm not lying, I, I am honest. Uh, they are identical to what I just had. I just put them in a different folder for it to uh, make it easier to understand. And then I'm going to create a file called a docker-compose.yaml. The first thing I need in here is I need to tell it what version it is. So it's going to be version 3 of this, this Docker Compose. Then I need to tell it what services I want to use. Can you stop that? So for my services, I want to have, so I'm going to have an Nginx, right? So I'm going to have an Nginx service. So I'm going to call it Nginx. Just by naming it like this, saying this is my service, that gets a network alias of Nginx by default, so I don't have to do anything else. I want Docker Compose to build it for me, and it will find the context that it should build inside of the folder called Nginx. So that's that folder there. And what else do I want? I want to have some ports. So let's go ahead and say I want to map port 8080 to port 80. And that's it for my Nginx. Actually, I want to have that at that level. So I've got my Nginx set up. I'm not explicitly defining the network here. Um, you can go ahead and, and give networks and, and explicitly define networks uh, to attach to and everything. If you don't, it defaults to create a network for you on the fly that it handles. So all of these services will be connected in its own network without me having to explicitly say, tell it to. But if you look here in my slides, you can see that my Nginx here is connected to the network, my network. And down here, I explicitly define a network called my network. So you can then go ahead and define a bunch of different networks and have different containers connected to different networks so they can't communicate with each other or can communicate and so on. So I've got my Nginx containers defined here. So I'm going to have a web service as well. And once again, it's, it's going to build it for me. And the context is going to be under app. And in this case, I need an environment variable. So I'm going to go and add environment, and I'm going to add a Redis equals Redis, like that. And I need to, actually, I don't need anything else in that one. And finally, I need a Redis container. And all I need to say here is that the image I wanted to use is Redis, like that. So this defines exactly the same thing that I just typed out with a bunch of commands, but in one declarative file instead. Open this thing up, go and say docker-compose. It's a separate tool, but it's installed with Docker for Windows as well, so it's in there. And you do docker-compose up. Docker-compose up will automatically look for a file called docker-compose.yaml. So it finds that. It builds the um, Nginx service for, uh, image for me because it wasn't available. And then it looks and it sees that uh, it builds the web uh, image for me because it wasn't available. And then it starts everything up. Let's see if we can get that in here in view. So it, it builds everything. And then once it's built all of the images as needed, it creates the new containers for me. And then 
since I didn't go and, and add da dash D for detached, it actually goes ahead and, oh, did, did that just freeze up? Okay, so for some reason I can't, I can't scroll this window anymore. Oh, so Visual Studio Code just died. Oh, there it is. It's back again. Ish. Okay, I have no idea what's happening. What it does, since I didn't add dash D, it actually attaches the output from all of the containers as once, at once and prefixes all of the output from the different containers. And if we pull up Chrome you will see that it has built all of the stuff that I need. So it built up the Nginx instance, it set up the Redis for me, it set up the web application for me, and it runs everything for me. And I can also in here, <laughs> it, it died on me, but it, it did work. I can do docker-compose-ps. <laughs> um, no, it is PS, and it seems like Docker does not... Oh, here it is. It, it kind of works. So it, it, it did set up um, a couple of um, machines for me, and I can look at that with Docker Compose, and I can also go Docker PS, and I can see the containers it set up for me. But I should really use Docker Compose to work with this thing. So if I do Docker Compose down, it once again reads the Docker Compose YAML file, figures out what containers it needs to kill and remove. And if we do docker ps-a, you can just see that it's removed all of them for me. So if I just check this stuff into source control, somebody can pull it from source control, run docker compose up, and have a full development environment ready to run on their machine. Which is kind of cool. Uh, and if we do docker images, you'll see that it actually did create some images for me as well, and they're all prefixed with the name of the folder that the Docker Compose file was located in. So that was my demo of composing a stop. So that's kind of cool, but right now I'm just running on a single machine, right? Um, and that's not what we want to do in production. In most cases, we want to build in a, in a farm or a, a cluster of machines. And that's where we've got separate tools coming in. So you've got, from the left, you've got Docker Swarm, you've got DCOS, and you've got Kubernetes. To be perfectly honest, Docker Swarm is probably going slightly away because Kubernetes is getting built into to Docker. Um, and Kubernetes is the way forward, but it does introduce a whole bunch of new things. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with Docker Swarm because it's a little bit simpler. But if if I were you and I want to start looking at this for production and I want to run it in a cluster, I would look at Kubernetes or DCOS. But my personal preference would be Kubernetes. It seems to be the way that everyone is going. So Docker Swarm is a way to run multiple machines as one Docker setup. So I can, I can run commands against it as it was just one Docker instance but it makes sure that it distributes everything across multiple machines. So to do that, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to pull up PowerShell, and I'm going to run it as an administrator. So what do you get when you install Docker for Windows is you get a tool called Docker Machine. So Docker Machine is a way for us to set up the virtual machines. So with Docker Machine, I can create a new new uh, application, but just do Docker Machine create. I tell it that I want to use Hyper-V, um, and I will give it a name and stuff like that. And it generates virtual machines that run inside of Hyper-V for me um, with Docker installed. So it's basically create virtual machines for me on the fly. Unfortunately, they are connected to um, the network, and my machine only has a wireless network. And whenever it changes IP address, the machines die on my machine for some reason. Um, so I just recreated my swarm, which is what I did when you came in and sat down in the room, for those of you who are in the room. Um, so hopefully this will work. But I've set up two machines. I've got a swarm master and a swarm worker. 
Uh, and they're located at 192.168.1.176 and 88. That's kind of all you need to know. Then we can do Docker machine SSH. That means the Docker machine will set up an SSH connection, an encrypted connection into my whatever machine that I define, in this case, Swarm Master. So it, it connects to the Swarm Master for me. And then inside of my Swarm Master, inside of that virtual machine, I want to run Docker Swarm init. I run that. So running that makes the Docker, uh, the Swarm Master virtual machine now has a Docker installation configured to be a manager inside of my Swarm. So it's the one that I'm going to be communicating with to run things on my worker nodes. Once I run Swarm init and it creates a Swarm for me, it tells me that to join a worker to this Swarm, run the following command. And it wants to run this thing here. So I'm going to copy that, and I'm going to do docker machine ssh into swarm worker. And I want to run the command docker swarm join and blah, 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 blah. And I run that, and that machine is now joined into the swarm. And I can do this on as many machines as I want. I can join in more and more machines, either as managers or as workers. And I can just increase the size of my cluster as big as I want to. I'll stick with just two machines because it's fairly simple. Then I have a little demo here prepared, the reverse swarm thing here. So I'm going to open that in code. So what I want to do now is, once again, you recognize the application. It's my app, the Nginx stuff. I have this same Docker Compose YAML file, basically. The only difference is that I'm actually pulling my images from a um, public repository. So I've taken my apps here. Actually, I, they're not the same. Sorry, I'm lying. The app is different. The app is actually using the non-build image instead for ASP.NET Core, and it uses a, a pre-built ASP.NET Core application instead. But pretty much, it's the same application. I've just uploaded, pushed it to a public repository, uh, re registry, which is my a, uh, Microsoft Azure registry, where I store my images in, in Azure. And I've uploaded them under the name My Nginx and My App. So I define, once again, Docker Compose YAML, kind of the same thing, services, Nginx service. Here is my image. Here are the ports I want to map. Here's the network that I want to use. But I've also had it depends on and says, this service here cannot run without the web. Because it can't, it can't reverse proxy something that doesn't exist. So I'm, I'm adding depends on web. Creating my web service. Image is available up here. Environment. Set an environment variable. Tell it what network to connect to. Tell it how many of it I want. So I want to have two replicas of this. So the Nginx, um, instance is going to redirect or it's going to proxy slash uh, HTTP colon slash slash web and then the network in here is going to make sure that it gets redirected and load balanced between two replicas of the web and this one depends on Redis and finally I have my Redis um, image or my Redis um, service uses the image Redis and it uses the network my network and finally, down here, you can see that I have defined my network. But I've also added another um, service here called Visualizer. It, it uses an image coming out of Docker samples called Visualizer. And I'm mapping port 8081 on the host to port 8080 in the container, because this application has a response to port 8080. I'm doing a weird mapping here where it actually maps uh, or mounts a socket connection um, on the host to a socket connection in the container. Slightly complicated stuff, but it makes it possible for this container to, to mess or listen to things that are happening in, inside of, of uh, Docker. And here, instead of, I've got deploy replicas here. Here I'm saying deploy placement and say, can you please only place this container 
on a node where the role equals manager. So this container can only work on manager nodes, not on worker nodes. So what we can do is we can tell it that I want to co connect only to manager nodes or run it only on managers, or I can tag my, my nodes with different tags and say, this has to run on this thing here that has high-speed disks or, or SSDs, or this thing can only run on nodes that have high memory or whatever. So we can define where our containers are deployed inside of the cluster, if that makes sense. Um, so let's go ahead and go and open up this thing here. So what I did before that you haven't seen is I did docker build, um, I built the app and I gave it the name, I basically tagged it with zero call dot azure, azure cr dot io slash my app, like that on my local machine. And once I had that built, I then did docker login, and that uh, actually docker login uh, zero call dot azure cr dot io that allows me to log in to my uh, set up my credentials for my registry so all of these uh, images are private so I logged into my uh, my registry and then afterwards I did docker push zero call dot azure cr dot io slash my app and that pushes all of my image up into that public repository so that it can be downloaded and used by anybody requesting it like that that has my credentials. I hope that makes sense, even though I, I prepped it a little bit. So finally, what I can do down here now is I can go ahead and say docker-machine, and I'm going to do env swarm master. This tells Docker Machine, it's uh, Docker Machine, ah, okay, sorry, can't do that in here, I have to do it from in here, ah, okay, um, just going to go in here, I, need, I think I need to have uh, admin privileges for this to work, so I'm going to do it. CD, I'm going to go in there, let's try Docker Machine, Docker Machine, env, Swarm master. So Docker machine swarm master gives me a, um, a PowerShell script back that I can use to configure the local Docker client on my machine to communicate with swarm master, that virtual machine, instead of the Linux, the Mobi, the Mobi one that Docker for Windows sets up. So I'm going to go and say Docker and swarm master invoke expression to run it. If I run that now and we do docker info, we get a bunch of information about the docker thing, about the docker server I'm connected to, and one of the things you'll see in here is that uh, it, it's part of a swarm, so it's uh, swarm active. Uh, it, the swarm has two managers, and one manager and two nodes. Um, and a bunch of things like that. So I am connected to the Swarm Manager at the moment. Um, and in here, if I just go ahead and say Docker stack, because I want to deploy a stack to my, my Swarm, deploy. So what I want to deploy is I want to deploy docker compose.yaml, that, that contains my configuration. And I want to call my stack demo stack. And I need to add with registry auth to make sure that it can authenticate with my uh, registry. If I run that, you can see here it creates the network called demo stack my network. It creates demo stack nginx, demo stack web, demo stack redis, demo stack visualizer. If we do docker stack ls, we can see that it has one stack called demo stack running at the moment that runs four services. Um, and the really cool thing is if we do docker machine ls, we can see that the swarm master is located at this IP address here, right? If I've got here and I browse to the swarm master port 8081, I end up with this visualizer that I set up. And the visualizer figures out that there are uh, two, uh, why did my, 
Oh, Redis went up and down. I don't know why. So I have two nodes in here. They're both up and running, so they're both green. They both have about one gig of RAM. And we can see here that the Swarm Master is running my web and the visualizer, and the worker is running the Redis cache, the Nginx uh, um, instance, and another web instance. And if we take this address here and we browse to 8080, that didn't turn out very well. Browse to port 8080 on that machine. You can see that response as before. But if I refresh this, you can now see that the machine name changes. So we are getting load balancing in here. And you can see the machine names is going from 9E3 to 543. And if we go in here, you should see that it says 9E3 on that one and 543 on that one. So what is happening is that when I request this thing here, it goes in and it connects to Swarm Master that looks at port 8080. And then it knows that port 8080 is mapped to demo stack Nginx on the Swarm Worker. So it redirects the call there. And that thing does a reverse proxy of slash web. And then it figures out that there are two of those. So it round robins between them and gives us load balancing between the two um, instances of web running on in the, the cluster. And once we're done with it, we're good with that. We don't need it anymore. We can just go ahead and say docker stack rm demo stack like that. And it removes everything for me. And if we do docker ps-a, you can see that for some reason it does store some of the old ones. That's apparently a bug. Uh, it's supposed to kill and remove all of the, uh, the containers, not just stop them. But it's kind of cool because it's, it's, it's actually that easy to deploy a, a whole stack of machines to a swarm and have it running in a cluster. And it, it makes sure that it sends out the containers to the least loaded machine. So it looks at performance on that machine. But you can also go and say, these containers need to be located together or these machines have to be on a, a node with this tag and so on. So what about Docker and Windows? So, so far I've only shown you stuff on Linux and I'm not gonna show you anything on Windows, you can relax, but Windows as of Windows 10 something and Windows Server, the latest version, it has Docker support built in. So you can go ahead and actually change, if I go down here and I look at my Docker for Windows, I can actually go in here and change to Windows containers. Um, and that means that I get other images to work with, because obviously the image I'm building is based on the, the host OS. So an, an image build for a Linux uh, host can only run on a Linux host today. And a, a, an image build for Windows, a Windows host can only run on a Windows host. Uh, but it's kind of cool because you can also put different, if you have like a Docker Swarm, you can put different um, hosts, both Windows and Linux inside of the Swarm and, and mix and basically say, I want to run these services here and this service here has to run on a Windows machine and this service here has to run on a Linux machine. So w Windows has actually implemented nicely enough to be able to join the Swarm and all of that and you can just run your, your containers on Windows as well. One thing to note, though, is it's a little bit different because you install and you do things in a Linux container slightly easier. So in Windows, it's all it's often all a matter of uh, enabling IIS and setting up IIS and setting up Windows features and stuff like that. So you need to do PowerShell stuff inside of your images instead of just copying files like I've shown you here. But it's still kind of cool, and I, I want to play a bit more with it. But so far, it's 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 not from what I hear, 100% stable, and I haven't needed it so far, but it should work perfectly fine to run on Windows as well. That was pretty much all I had to say. Um, that took way longer than I expected it to. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, I don't know how long you expected me to talk, but I ended up doing almost two hours. Um, I don't know if you have any questions. If you do, you're more than welcome to ask them. Um, if you don't, uh, I'm available on Twitter at, at zero call if you want to want to ping me or have any questions. Um, if you want to have the source code for it, I can give you that. Uh, I'm not sure that the source code 
is very helpful. Well, actually, you are recording it, so you, you should be able to use my source code and the recording to figure out how to run it. Um, other than that, I just want to thank, thank you for listening and see if there's any if there are any questions. Back here, I guess. Are there any questions in here? No. Nope. Not a question. Feel free. <laughs> okay. It's complete silence, and everybody's going, "Why didn't that fucker shut up?" Not <laughs> <laughs> really. Maybe it's a buffer overflow on the on the brains currently. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sorry that that it is a lot of content, but it's kind of <laughs> no, don't worry. that is to, it's to me kind of the bare minimum that you need to understand to actually be able to use Docker properly. Um, I was just watching it, it, in some phases, and it seems like this. Um, you know, from my perspective, it was a pretty cool call, uh, talk. Thank you very much. And um, thank you. Sorry for these interruptions at the beginning. We had some network problems here, and we had no problems at all. Yeah. So. I have no question, maybe a last one. Um, I'm not sure. Are you an MVP? Yes. Okay, then we possibly meet in March at the beginning in Redmond. Oh, okay, you're an MVP as well. Yeah, I'm there. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be there. I'm doing the MVP summit and then flying to Vegas the week after to do VS Live. <laughs> yeah, cool. Well, it's good talking to you guys, or it's one-way communication, sorry about that. But once again, if you have anything, go ahead and ping me on Twitter. Um, there might be an email address if you want to as well, if you've got anything longer than that, and I'm, I'm more than help, happy to help out. Uh, most of what I've said is also documented on my blog um, uh, that you can get if you ping me on Twitter, the address for, uh, if you want to read it and, and think about it a little bit more. Cool. Thank you very much. Other than that, thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm going to sign off. Okay. Thanks, Ken. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye.